Sup YouTube, Official Coding Network, and welcome to the second episode of this Java programming tutorial series. Last episode, we installed the necessary software required to follow along with this tutorial, and we wrote our first lines of code. In this episode, we're going to create the window for our game. Now, when I recorded the first episode, I actually didn't know what type of game I was going to create in this tutorial series, which I really should have planned earlier. But eventually, I settled on a 2D top-down game where you're constantly trying to survive enemies that are trying to kill you, and the aim of the game is to survive for as long as you can. We will also be adding multiple weapons, enemy types, and their own behaviors, etc. Okay, so now before we start creating our window, uh, there's one thing I want to explain that I didn't explain in the last episode, as I didn't want to overload you all with too much information in one episode, and that is bodies and statements. Firstly, a body is pretty much a container for code. Let's take our main method for example. These curly brackets represent the area of this body. All the code written inside these curly brackets are contained within the body. If you look at our class, you can see that it contains a body as well, and we can create another body within it, like we're doing with our main method. So now statements are the actual instructions that our compiler reads and executes. You can think of bodies as uh, kind of like a container for these instructions, and the statements as the instructions themselves. An easy way to tell if a line of code is a statement is checking whether it has a semicolon at the end of the line or not. If you look at this system.out.print line, we can tell it's a statement because it has a semicolon on the end of it. Now, the thing is, if we look at public class game, for example, you can see it doesn't contain a semicolon, but it's not really the actual body at the same time. It really just has a body, so pretty much you can think of it as a line of code containing a body, but not the actual body itself. Alright, so now that's out of the way. What we're going to create now is called a JFrame. Our JFrame is pretty much going to be the window or display that eventually we'll draw all our own graphics on all that onto. To create our JFrame, it's pretty simple. Go to your main method, uh, delete this line of code, and type JFrame frame is equal to new JFrame. Now, remember last episode when I mentioned Java has a huge amount of built-in classes that we can use for ourselves? This JFrame object we just created is one of Java's built-in classes. A more common way to refer to an object of a class is called an instance. In this case, we have created an instance of JFrame. By creating this instance of JFrame, we have created a template of the JFrame class, and soon we will write the code that will change this JFrame to suit our personal needs. Before we do that, however, let's quickly look at this line of code a bit more. Before we do that, however, before we do that, however, let's look at this line of code a bit more. The first two words, JFrame and frame, tell us the class we're creating an instance of, and the name of the instance. In this case, JFrame is the class we're creating an instance of, and frame is the name of that instance, in which the name of the instance is what we're going to refer to when we're actually uh, modifying it or coding for it. But these two words are enough. To fully create an instance of JFrame, we have to set it equal to a new JFrame object by typing equals new JFrame. But if we type this, you can see that we get a red squiggly line under JFrame, kind of like in Microsoft Word when you spell a word wrong. If we hover over this, it says, the JFrame cannot be resolved to a type. Now this occurs because currently, we cannot access this JFrame class to either make an instance of or access one of its functions, because it's in a different package to our game class, which is what we're trying to access JFrame from. To give ourselves access to this JFrame class, we have to import the package that the JFrame class is contained in into our own class, and to do that, we can hover over what we want to import, and a little UI pops up where we can click Import JFrame. As you can see, the import statement appears above our class and below our package declaration. A faster way to do this is to press Ctrl Shift O on your keyboard, or you can be like me because I'm cool and all that and have it bound to your mouse. And as you can see, once the import is there, uh, the error has gone away for the JFrame. So looking into these first two words a little bit more, they don't actually create a new JFrame instance, but rather declare it. And what I mean by declaring something is, you're pretty much telling the compiler that this instance exists, but we don't care at all about its properties and how it looks or works. We also can't access or modify its elements, but we're just saying it exists. But when we type equals new JFrame, we define how our JFrame instance is actually created by setting it to equal to a new JFrame. And a good question is, why would we declare something but not define it? And uh, we'll get to that in a bit when I can give you a good example. The next part, if you can feel free to skip if you want to, but we can also give our frame a title. To do that, think back to printing something in the console where we put quotation marks inside of brackets. We want to do the same thing for our JFrame. We want to put quotation marks inside of its brackets and uh, give it whatever name you want. 
I'm going to name mine Official Coding Network Java Tutorial. This title will appear at the top of our frame and you'll see that once we finish creating it and actually run it. Now back to our question which was, now back to our, now back to our question which was, why don't we declare something but, and now back to our question which was, why would we declare something but not define it? Well the reason for this is because it gives us the ability to define it in different ways depending on certain conditions within our code. A simplified example is, if a certain condition within our code is true, then we can declare our JFrame with a name. But if that condition is false, then we don't give it a name or a different name. Once you get more programming experience, it's easier to see more practical uses for this, but it's pretty much about having flexibility and being allowed to set certain properties of objects or variables based on certain conditions within your code. Alright, so now all that boring stuff is out of the way, let's set some more properties for our JFrame. The first thing we want to do is set the size for our JFrame in pixels. And to do that, we type in frame.set size. And this arg0 and arg1 stands for argument0 and argument1. And in these arguments, we're going to put in the width and height of our frame in pixels, which I'm going to set to 1280 by 720. The next thing we want to type is frame.set resizable false. And what this does, it makes it so we can't resize our window. And why we would want that is that if we resize our frame currently, it would cause many graphical errors and our game won't render like it's supposed to, it'll just render like really weird. I'll probably implement something that allows us to resize our frame in a future episode, but for now we're going to keep it false. If we change this to true however, it will allow us to resize our frame, but I'm going to set it to false. Now the next statement we're going to write will make it so whenever we run our game, our frame will appear in the center of our monitor rather than just in the top left or some other random position. And that statement is frame.set location relative to null. And see how I was typing set location relative to, like Eclipse automatically recognized it for me and I could just use the arrows to navigate to it and press enter to select it from there. So that's a cool little feature that Eclipse has. Alright, so under that we want to type frame.set default close operation and inside the brackets jframe.exit on close. And this controls what happens when we click the little red X at the top of our window. When we click on the X, we want our window to close manually and nothing else. So that's what jframe.exit on close is. And the final thing we want to do is type frame.set visible equal to true. And this is pretty self-explanatory. It makes our frame visible because why wouldn't we want to see it? All right, so if we run our game now, we should see our window. It has the title we made, the size that we wanted, um, it appeared at the center of our screen. Uh, we can't resize it if we try to, but uh, we can minimize it. And if we uh, close our window, yeah, it closes like normal. So yeah, that's going to wrap up episode two of this game programming tutorial series. If you enjoyed, make sure to like, subscribe, and share. Leave a comment if you have any feedback, whether it's positive or negative. If you're having a problem with your game, either email me or contact me on one of my social medias. I'll see you all soon. Bye.